Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In sermon number 16 on the Gospel of Matthew, which is focused on chapter 5 of that text, John Chrysostom is going to be focusing primarily on the verses that have to do with anger and trying to explain that to his audience. But prior to that, he is going to engage in a sort of defense of both what he calls the old law and the precepts that Christ is giving in the Sermon on the Mount that are taking the law that's provided in the Torah and also you know, exemplified, you could say, in the prophets and going further with it. And the homily begins by quoting, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, right? And what is Chrysostom's point in doing this? Well, he's, he's got several different audiences in mind um, you know he's primarily talking to Christians but this is within a context in which there's a lot of Christian Jewish polemics still going on and Christianity has become you could say divided into a number of different sects or communities um, one of which is particularly important as an adversary, and that is the Manichaeans, one of the Gnostic sects. And so uh, Chrysostom is going to be defending you know, Orthodox Christianity, the sort of mainstream views against those. So we've got this context of the Jewish law, um, Sermon on the Mount talking about that, providing some amplifications, and then the Manichaeans, and you see this in section three, where he says, um, uh, think not that I am come to destroy. He subjoined, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And he says, now, this not only obstructs the obstinacy of the Jews, who would be saying, yeah, you know, you don't need all this extra stuff that Jesus is bringing, but stops the mouths of those heretics who say that the old covenant is of the devil. For if Christ came to destroy his tyranny, how is this covenant not only not destroyed, but even fulfilled by him? And then he says, Christ said, not only I do not destroy it, though this had been enough, but I even fulfill it. So this is a third option, you could say, between um, old law is good, follow the old law, old law is bad, which is what the Manichaeans are saying, get rid of it. This Jesus person is coming to provide a new way of thinking about things, a new way of living. Yes, coming from a Jewish matrix, but leaving that behind. And then Christians who are saying, no, no, both of these. We, we actually want to have both of these. They're connected together. And so, you know, there's this emphasis on not destroying the law, but fulfilling it. And what does that mean? So he goes on and he says, well, how, one may ask, did he not destroy it? In what way did he rather fulfill either the law or the prophets? And at first, at this point in the sermon or homily, Chrysostom is going to say, well, there's three main ways. And then, as is so usual for people when they make a list, he comes up with some additional ones as well. The first is, he says, well... Um, the prophets he fulfilled in as much as he confirmed by his actions all that had been said concerning him. Um, the evangelist used to say in each case that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And that probably, except for certain kinds of Christians, less interesting, less attractive uh, you know, in, in the present, but it was, it was very persuasive in the past. 
Probably more important is the second thing that he points out. Um, so he says, um, the law he fulfilled not in one way only, but a second and third, in one way by transgressing none of the precepts of the law, for that he did fulfill it all. Hear what he said to John, for it, it, thus it becomes, becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And to the Jews, he also said, which of you convicts me of sin? And to his disciples, the prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. So you know, Jesus is uh, following the old law rather than destroying it and then adding additional important precepts to it as by way of fulfilling it. And then, interestingly, Chrysostom says that Jesus makes it possible for others to fulfill the law, right? He says, uh, this was a, um, another sense. Uh, he did the same through us also. This is the marvel that he himself, not only himself fulfilled it, but he granted this to us likewise. So he, in, in whatever way we're going to explain this, according to Chrysostom, uh, Christ is making it possible for those within his community or perhaps everybody to fulfill the, the law. At the same time, because of what Christ is saying, specifically in relation to the law, the law is becoming, you could say, a bigger code, right? And it's going further than it did in the past. We can talk about additional precepts. Um, and so he says, uh, you'll, you'll find another sense in which this has been done. What sort? In the sense of that future code of laws, which he was about to deliver to him for his sayings were no repeal of the earlier law, but a drawing out and filling up of them. Thus, not to kill is not annulled by the saying, be not angry, but is filled up and put in greater security. And so of all the others. <clears throat> and he, um, Chrysostom says that, you know, at first in preaching this, because this is like, you know, not at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. This is after some other things have been laid out. He's like, well, if you like read between the lines and think about the applications, you're going to see that, you know, what's being said in terms of I say to you, here's the new rule is already in there. Say, for example, in the Beatitudes at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And so, you know, if we go on with this, uh, what are these additional precepts supposed to do? Well, he talks for a little bit about like, if you're breaking these precepts, you're going to be one of the least in the kingdom of heaven, or you might not even get in. Why? Well, because you actually have to be following the law for, you know, what the law is about. Righteousness or justice is another way of putting it and he tells his followers and this is you know kind of a contemporary issue right he says unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the pharisees you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven this is an important thing to think about so who are the scribes the scribes are the people who are actually copying out the religious texts and they get to know them very well as a result, they're kind of a community resource. The Pharisees, uh, which is, you know, later on going to become this rabbinical movement, right? That, that's uh, so closely identified with Judaism throughout the centuries. They are rather popular religious teachers who live a fairly strict life and are, you know, looked at with respect by the ordinary people. Um, they're opposed to the people who actually control the temple, the Sadducees. Um, Jesus goes after the Pharisees a lot more because he's in contact with them uh, a lot more. So, you know, they have righteousness in some sense because they're following the strict uh, codes of the law. But they're also lacking it in another respect, according to Chrysostom. How so? Well, he tells us here by righteousness, he means the whole of virtue. And he brings up Job as an example of this. He was a blameless man, righteous. Um, well, what does that actually mean? You know, so if you think about how you follow <clears throat> rules or laws or commandments, you can do so by 
fulfilling the letter of the law and doing what it says. So, you know, when it comes to thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder, one of the uh, Ten Commandments or Ten Words, um, well, don't kill anybody, right? Or don't murder anybody. Um, But that doesn't mean that you're virtuous. That just means you're actually following a rule. And what Jesus is telling people is that what God wants from them is something more inward, something that has to do with um, how we feel and how we're motivated and all of, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so, you know, he's going to talk about the old and the new as actually being of the same tribe and kindred. They are not separate uh, in, in kind from each other. Right. And so this is going to be uh, quite important. And again, this goes back to opposing the Manichaeans who would say, oh, the old law, very bad. The new law, very good. There's a radical separation between them. Chrysostom, like most Orthodox Christians, is interpreting it as Jesus is saying, you got the old law. We're not taking that away. We're not even going to take one iota, one little dot from the top of an eye uh, from it. But um, rather, we're going to add some stuff that clarifies, that uh, you could say expands the law. And so these are not completely separated from each other. And so he says, um, you know, we need to defend the law against people who are attacking it. Let us now ask those who reject the law is be not angry, contrary to do no murder or do not kill. Or is the one commandment the completion and the development of the other? And he says, clearly the one is, namely, be not angry, uh, the fulfilling of the other. And this is on the very account. Why? Well, if you're not getting angry at people, uh, then you're going to much more refrain from murder. And he who bridles wrath will much more keep his hands to himself. For wrath is the root of of murder. And he says, if you cut the, the, cut up the root, you will much more remove the branches or you will not permit them as much to shoot out as all. Right. So he says, so he didn't come to abolish the law. Um, he actually wanted a more complete observation of the law. What design did the law enjoin these things? Was it not that no one might slay his neighbor. So f- opposing the law would have to enjoin neighbor, uh, killing your, your neighbor, right? Um, and he says, if you don't let a person be even angry, the mind of the law is established by a more completely. One that studies to avoid murder will not refrain from it equally with those who's put away even anger. Now, is, is Chrysostom saying that the only reason people ever murder each other is over anger? No, I mean, greed is another big one as well. But if you get rid of the anger or you say, don't give in to the anger, uh, you're much more likely to follow the, the uh other part of the law. And you could think, for example, about biblical examples. The very first murder, the very first death in the Genesis story occurs because of anger. Says it right there in the text. So this is one important consideration. And then other people would argue that, well, the old law is actually cruel. It's it's not nice. You know, what does the old law actually say? Not only does it say don't murder, but it also says, well, if you do murder, then kill them, right? This goes all the way back to Genesis as well. It's one of the rules that's given to to Noah. And then there's this other passage, what we often call the law of Talion, um, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So if somebody doesn't even kill somebody, but they knock their eye out. Well, you knock their eye out as as well. And then we got two one-eyed people or somebody who knocks somebody's tooth out, punching him in the face, perhaps gets their tooth knocked out. And this sounds kind of barbaric, right? Uh, And so the Manichaeans could say, that's a bad old law. We want to get past that and leave that behind. Chrysostom is very interestingly going to say, you've got this all wrong. 
You've got the perspective mixed up. Um, is the old law evil? No. He says it's the highest kind of philanthropy. He talks about it as stemming from mercy or pity, you could say, rather than from cruelty. How, how so? He says he made this law not that we might strike out each other's eyes, but that fear of suffering by others might restrain us from doing any such thing to them. And he brings up the example of the Ninevites. If you've ever read uh, the story of Jonah, the prophet who's, you know, gets swallowed by the whale and spit up and all that sort of stuff. He's trying to avoid going to the Ninevites who are uh, non-Jewish people uh, to preach repentance and so, you know, finally he gets there and he preaches, he wanders around the city and the Ninevites actually listen and they're like, yeah, God's going to smite us. Let's actually start behaving properly. And then Jonah is ticked off himself, sulking under a tree because God didn't smite the Ninevites. And, you know, the, the moral of the story is in part, hey, let God do what God is going to do. Let's, ha let's celebrate goodness instead. So he says, um, Therefore, he threatened the Ninevites with overthrow, not that he might destroy them. For had that been his will, he should have just been silent, but that he might by fear make them better and so quiet his wrath. And so he appointed a punishment for those who wantonly assail the eyes of others, that if good principle does not dispose them to refrain from this cruelty, fear might restrain them from injuring their neighbor's sight. So, you know, instead of it being a cruel rule, it's actually God keeping people in check. A little bit later, uh, uh, Chrysostom is going to say, don't you see how the commandments so far from coming of cruelty come rather of abounding mercy, right? And if on account of these you call the lawgiver grievous and hard to bear with, tell me which kind of command is more toilsome and grievous. Do no murder? I mean, do you have a hard time not murdering people? If you do, well, then you've got trouble. Or be not even angry. Which is more an extreme? He who exacts a penalty for murder or for mere anger, right? He also talks about the adulterer, um, but we're going to skip over that here. So he says, whereas we say there's but one in the same legislator of either covenant, um, who dispensed all meetly and adapted to the difference of the times, the difference between the two systems of law. So actually these, these go together and you could say, well, what if, you know, what if you actually took away the law? It would be chaos. It would be even worse. So it's not cruelty to impose this old law, but it's time to bring about a new set of precepts that don't take away the old law, but rather fulfill it. Right? So the new precepts, in a certain respect, are even more merciful and philanthropic or loving of human beings than was the old law by itself. But if the old law isn't being put away, it's being reinterpreted and expanded. So this is uh, Chrysostom's defense of both the old and the new law as kind of harmonized with each other. Uh, against, you know, two polemical groups, uh, Jews who would say, well, you don't need the new law. This is actually extra stuff. And the Manichaeans and other Gnostic Christians who would say, well, the old law was all bad. Get rid of it. Christians want to observe or Orthodox Christians want to observe both of these. And so that's why Chrysostom is explaining things this way.